Pittsburgh. Um, I do a bunch of things. I'm a writer. I uh, have an internet uh, security company, uh, internet privacy company called Crypto Hippie, and about 50 other things that I do at various places and times. Uh, my name is Jeff Berwick. I, I'm a serial engineer. I, um, always been that way. I've started a number of companies. I had a tech company back in the tech bubble days uh, that almost was worth a billion dollars for a few hours and then it was worth nothing. Uh, and then, um, that was interesting. And then, uh, then I went and traveled the world to figure out what was going on because I didn't know why that happened. And through that I found anarchism and, and uh, Austrian economics and realized how all these bubbles start from the printing of the money and all that sort of thing. And because I realized all that over about a 10 year period where I traveled the world, I went to about 100 different countries, um, I thought I should really write more about what I know now. Um, and so I started a newsletter called The Dollar Vigilante, and I write about the coming collapse of the US dollar and the, and the monetary system, and how to protect yourself from it, and how to also uh, do different things like expatriate or get your assets or start companies around the world, that sort of thing. That's a lot of the stuff that I've done. Now I live in Mexico at the moment. And, but I've Basically, haven't lived. I'm from Canada originally, and haven't lived there for about ten years, and I will, I'll never live there again. That, you know, it's cold and boring. But. <laughs> and you do Anarchat. Oh yes, and I also do uh, Anarchat. It's uh, uh, I do lots of things. That's why it's hard to say. But um, yeah, it's an Anarchist uh, podcast. Uh, just Anarchat.com. Cool. Well, I'd say I'm also a serial entrepreneur. I, uh, or you can say a hustler. Okay. Yeah. I um, I had. Uh, you know, a ton of jobs since I was like 15, I was selling knives, phone service, computer consulting, map tutoring, I was doing all these things as a kid. But uh, I, I got into commercial real estate and that's when I really got up. And when I was 25, I was in the top 10 in the state of California, top 20 in the world with Freebox Commercial. It continued that next year. I, I met a lot of incredible, crazy people and then the whole market collapsed and I went to shit. It's, <laughs> it's dead, it's not even on life support. Commercial real estate's gone. But, um, and I realized the value of recurring income and started a parking business with somebody. We got 26 locations around LA, we grew really fast. And now I'm selling that and I'm actually getting into other things. And I'll talk about that more, but basically, I, I, my skill set is not necessarily buildings and floors and floor plans and all that. It's really how to get really stubborn bastards that, that are very difficult together uh, when they have value to offer each other, no matter how stubborn they are. And that's, that's the difficulty. Making deals. So, yeah, I don't know what you guys feel. There's so many things to talk about, but entrepreneurship, or if anyone has any questions, just shut them out right now. Someone open the most up. Go ahead. Hi, um, I have a question about doing business in a status quo. Uh, I myself uh, was an entrepreneur, and uh, I was in the field of transport, which is heavily influenced by the state, obviously, the state mentioned in the road. Um, what, is your, what are your thoughts about you know, the challenges, um, both practical and moral, of doing business within the state as well? For me personally, sorry, I've <coughs> had a lot of time ahead. The, um, I haven't actually tried to do business in the Western world, in the status world, uh, since I became an anarchist, and I never really even thought about it. Um, I, and <coughs> if I think about it, I don't think I would start a business in the US or Canada or any of these countries that have all this statism. So it is very difficult. However, um, I think there are businesses you can do that can stay under the radar a little bit. For me personally, like I've started a number of businesses in Mexico. I've got a, I found a building that has condos. And I thought they were really cheap, they're like $60,000 on the beach, and but they're a little old, they're like 30 years old, they just needed to be renovated. So I started to offer them for sale, so like no company or nothing, just offer them for sale. I found a real estate agent who was selling them, right? And, the, and they don't even have a website, they don't even know what the internet is really or anything. <laughs> and uh, so I, I just offered what they were offering on the internet, plus $5,000 per condo, right? And uh, I sold a few. And then what I did is I renovated it for the people, and then after I did that, I thought, well, why don't I make them all rented from the same? And then, because none of these people want to live there full time, it's just like a vacation home. Then I rented out for them. So I also have a hotel now. Now, this also doesn't have a corporation or anything. I don't pay any taxes. Now, that's probably illegal in Mexico. However, in Mexico, everything's sort of like you just do what you want. <laughs> someone, someone will come by at some point, and I'll probably just, like, $100 get out of here. So, in most 
rest of the world, the government's just a nuisance. It's not like here. Here, the government is, is a serious <laughs> force. Um, so, sort of to answer your question, or and there is no real answer to your question. Just thoughts on your question is that I'm not sure if I'd want to do business in the U.S. But I guess if you're stuck here, and maybe you guys, you you live here, so. Uh, yeah, I can I can certainly think about that. The answer is like, how to do business in a status world, and what are the implications? Well, it's really frustrating and great. And and I I mean, I have right now a parking company that I recently set up. And going to every time I get a new location, I have to go downtown, get fingerprinted, uh, fill out all these forms every every single time. And I almost don't even want to go through this, through the process of getting a new location. And then there's all these permits, there's like a business permit, there's a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, there's a business permit, there's a police permit, and then there's actually a valet parking permit. And and I we paid like these things come in the mail and you just pay it and renew it and that kind of thing. So our valet parking permit didn't come to be renewed. So I just paid everything, renewed it, and then they waited till the next day after like the valet parking permit wasn't renewed. And they went to our owner of the restaurant, shut us down, and told them we're going to shut you down. We can, because you're operating without a permit. They need to have that. It scared the shit out of us. It was a five thousand dollar permit. We, we went and paid it. They gave us a thousand dollar fee for being late. Uh, you know, and, and like, and the bureaucrat was yelling at me, like, we could shut you down. You know, and, and he was just really nasty about it. And then he found three other things that were two hundred fifty dollar violations, like sitting in the loading zone for like a few minutes because he was scaring the shit out of my employees. So he gave us $250 fee for all these different things. It was really, really degrading. And then I have to, I can't even argue with the guy because he says I'm gonna tell the company that they can't work with you. And I'm like, I can't speak. So I understand clearly why a lot of, I'm a valet parking, that's a valet parking company. I can understand why a lot of big corporations shut the fuck up because they can't, they cannot screw up their whole company. And it's just, it's just really upsetting sometimes. So you just have to deal with it. Let me take an, another another uh, set of experiences. Uh, it depends on your business. That kind of business, you're screwed. I mean, you have to, they can shut you down, and they will, unless you pay off politicians or you have friends, and that's a whole other set of issues to deal with. Um, personally, when I set up companies, I just do what's gonna make money. I, and then, then I, I just, Start looking at it. Say, okay, I can do this. This is a good idea. This is a good idea. Here's my here's my model. Are there any problems that I have to look at? And a lot of times they're not that bad. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do that have built-in sort of breaks in them. I just I just personally kind of ignore the system and do what I and do what I want to do. And then I say, well, is there some reason I can't do this? And then I'll adapt accordingly. Um, as a writer, uh, I don't pay social security taxes. I'm out. I don't have to do it because if I get paid, I arrange it so I get paid in royalties. For royalties, you don't have to pay social security. Um, so I'm, I arrange my income to come that way. Uh, and there's all sorts of ways you can do, uh, but not in every business. If you're in trucking, you've got a set of problems and you have to work around them. There are very often workarounds. Uh, um, I don't know that business in particular. One of the things you can do if you have businesses that are really stuck in situations like that is play jurisdictional arbitrage and set up your corporation in wherever. Let's pick an old favorite, um, uh, you know, Bermuda. You know, set up your corporation in Bermuda. Uh, have your corporate office somewhere else. And you can legally skate around a lot of problems that way. Um, doing business offshore is difficult. Um, people in a lot of other places don't uh, answer the phone and take care of problems like they do in the US and other places. And, you know, there really are advantages for doing business in first world countries. And, you know, there's a, uh, an expectation of a, of people getting things done when they say they're supposed to get them done. They sometimes fail, but everyone gets ticked off when they fail. Mm -hmm. And they t it tends to reinforce them getting things done the way they promise. Um, so sometimes it can be done. Uh, it just depends what business. Um, and if you can do it in the first world and do it your way, 
there are certain advantages because offshore stuff is just slow and difficult. It's uh, interesting about uh, what you're saying about foreign countries, and especially a lot of the Car Caribbean countries and the Latin American countries. Asia's pretty good, right? But yeah. I like uh, Singapore and Hong Kong are great. But um, yeah, it's funny. I, I know a guy who's uh, building some houses down in Argentina right now, and he's an American. And a lot of Americans sort of have this impression that the world works like America everywhere else. So, so they're, they're not really a lot of them. They get really confused what's going on. For whatever reason, I never thought that to start with. So I was, I was always okay. I just go with the flow of whatever culture I'm in. But after, you know, he's trying to build these houses, and the guy would give him the date that it'll be done. And every single time, it was nowhere near done by that day. And the guy was, the American said to him, he said, "Why? Just please, like, I don't care what the date is. Like, just give me a date that you can actually get it done by, so I can actually plan my things around it." And the Argentine said to him, well, you know, that's not how we do it here. And he goes, well, well, how do you do it here? He goes, we give you a date that we think you're really going to like. <laughs> and, he goes, yeah. and he goes, and then we deal with the disappointment later. <laughs> so that, you know, so there is, you know, there's all, nothing easy to do. But you just have to get used to different ways to do different business with different things. Perfect. All right, we just got a question. Yeah, we have a On this landing page, Jeff, uh, what, what do you guys all think? intellectual property. So I know you have like, the dollar video and you have a uh, subscription thing on there. Yeah. Like that. I was just thinking about that today in the shower. <laughs> I was thinking well, what I was thinking what if someone started a website and they actually subscribed to all stuff like mine that are paid for newsletters and then they put it up on their website for free mm -hmm. uh, you know and then they have them sort of advertising as their economic model. I was thinking what would I do? Because I'm I don't like but what I've looked into with intellectual property, I, I actually don't really um, believe, well, definitely the government shouldn't be involved in, in anything to do with that. I think it should be fairly voluntary, and I don't think, I don't believe in patents or anything like that. Uh, but I do write a newsletter where I charge people, so how do I justify that? And basically, the way I look at it is, I offer a service, and I'm asking people to pay me, and I'm hoping they're going to pay me. Uh, if someone does steal it, I don't really have a major problem with it, other than to say to them, hey, I'm trying to be honest here. You're, uh, you know that I don't want you to take it and you're doing it anyway, that's just not very nice. So mm -hmm. if I meet you, I'll look down on you somewhat for doing that, but I'm not going to force you with a gun to stop doing it. Uh, so it is a little difficult, uh, but I don't think, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, I think most people in general want to uh, support the things that they believe in. And uh, just as an example, you know, if I made a crappy iPhone that looks like an iPhone, but uh, you know, and it, but it costs like ten dollars, uh, and you know, even if it had a lot of the functional functionality, but it, it wasn't quite an iPhone, you know, your friends would say, "Oh, you got that cheap one." And there's always that sort of like prestige level of paying for things as well. There's a whole bunch of social things involved with that, so I don't worry about it too much from my standpoint. Uh, I the subscription base is going up, so I've been doing well, and. Um, uh, yeah, but I don't really, uh, maybe you guys have some other ideas on that. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, it's a really interesting question. I've been in publishing since the middle 1980s. Uh, and I've written for all, almost all of the big publishers <coughs> and so on and so forth. So I'm right in the middle of this thing. And I've had books that have gone up on the torrent that have had, you know, thousands and thousands of downloads and nobody sent me a freaking nickel. Um, well, a couple of people did. But, um, so it's, it's a really interesting question. I once had somebody steal a book from me, just flat steal it from me, put their name on it and sell, sell the book, pay the book. And I called them up and, did, and they answered and they said, oh, oh, Rosenberg, I said, we thought you were dead. I said, oh, really? Thanks a lot. You know, I'm here. You know, you're printing my book and put your name on it. Oh, oh, we're really sorry. We thought you were dead. So, you know, they started paying me royalties. So rather than suing them, I just took the royalties. Um, anyhow, it's a tough it's a tough problem because the old model is dying and the new model isn't in place yet. One way or another, people who work and you know really work hard to produce good ideas will be paid. People people in this room, people at this show, do value that and they will pay for it. The old publishing model is dying really hard. Um, the new one isn't in shape yet, and it's a problem. The really interesting work done on this was by uh, a guy in New York named Clay Shirky. And, uh, oh, what was the name of the article he wrote? 
I don't recall, it was based upon the, the uh, research of a lady named Heinz Eisenstein. Um, and he found out that when Gutenberg came in, the old way had a really collapse, really be gone before the new way took shape of distributing information. Um, and I think that's where we are now. The old way is falling down, the new way really hasn't taken shape yet, and we're stuck in the ugly in between. Um, personally, I am now of the opinion that I don't like intellectual property rights. I certainly don't like the state enforcing them. I don't like the way um, that companies are now using patents and other things to uh, create artificial scarcity. Um, I think when the new way comes along, however it takes shape, I wish I knew, um, it won't have those things and producers will still get paid uh, in a variety of ways. And right now we're just stuck in the ugly middle waiting to see what happens. That's the best I know. Yeah, I don't have much doubt on intellectual property. I have a blog and I put up everything for free, so I'm not in the business of charging anybody for a publication. But does anyone have any other questions about entrepreneurship? I um I've read a number of things in terms of like starting a business from guys like or looked into literature from things like Doug Casey or Robert Kiyosaki about like you know how you can start certain types of businesses but like I often feel like there's a sort of a gap in terms of like how much capital some people can have to like you know invest in certain ideas and certain um, endeavors and then how much like, money you might actually have especially if you're a young person. Um, I was just wondering if you guys would have particular advice to people who may not have as much capital to, to start investment in a project, but um, have ideas. Sure. I'll, I'll go. I mean, I usually start everything from nothing. I don't think I've ever had anything that I had an outside investor in ever. Um, I haven't started anything huge, so maybe that's maybe that's a, a difference. But I, you know, if something's profitable and <coughs> it should. You know, the way I look at it, I want it to finance itself. I don't. I I would take outside investment or have an angel or something like that if there was a particular situation that I thought warranted it. But to be honest, I like doing things my own way, and it's more important to me than just dollars. Um, so myself, I don't care that much for having a multi gazillion dollar company. I like. Having, I like making things that I like, and I like making things that I think matter or are important. And of course, I want to make money from them too. Um, I, I'm not really comfortable with the big company model. I like small companies. That's you know me. Uh, yeah. Well, I can say two different examples. First of all, when I started commercial real estate, I was 23 years old. I saved up to that point on, on my own money about thirty thousand dollars, and I spent that on different things with our company, uh, starting a partnership. And for the six months, first six months, I made back like 3,000. And I, and I almost wanted to give up, uh, to be honest with you, because <coughs> the point is that, th that you really just you need to just, if it's believable, if it's possible, it, it has more to do with that than, and, and that you're willing to just do whatever you need to do to get this done. That has a lot more to do with it than the money that you have invested in it. Um, your determination and the, the re the realistic possibilities of the project. But the next six months, uh, after I, I was even considering quitting, the next six months I made 100000 in that six months. And then the next year I was in the top 10 in the state of California. Yeah. Right now. The, and, and the truth is that, that what you've got to realize when you're starting something new and you know, you're know you an entrepreneur, you're not a salary person, you don't have a steady income, uh, you've got to understand that we all start ignorant and incompetent if you're starting something completely new. And you gotta, but that's not an insult, everybody is. And one time you didn't know how to walk or tie your shoes. And you, you all start that way. And at first, all you've got is your persistence and your determination. You don't have any skills. Or you might, but, but very likely you don't. Or let, let's just go with the very basics, because I didn't. I was, I was horrible. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just totally ignorant. You, you, have, you have no skills, but you got a lot of drive and determination and persistence. So that'll get you somewhere. You start getting a sense of things, you start gaining some skills, and you start getting a better return on your energy. And then you start to see that you're like getting closer to putting deals together. You know, I was in commercial real estate to do multi-million dollar deals, they're really big. And I was 23, and they looked at me like, where's my father? Everybody in this business in the 40s and 50s. Uh -huh. 
So it was like a joke, like he's gonna represent me on a six million dollar building. I couldn't get anybody. They were like hanging up the phone on me. They were really nasty. I was like nervous. And in any case, you, you you start to I started getting closer to putting deals together, and then I had deals that were like slipping through my fingers. And that's when, after six months, I was like, you know what? Maybe I'm not appropriate for this. Maybe this is not the right business for me. It's you always feel like quitting right before you're about to break through the most. And the reason is because that's the most frustrating point where you spent all that time and deals are slipping through your fingers and they're getting closer. You don't realize you just stepped up huge and, and you're actually near, that's, that's, that's a higher stage in your development and you're about to like, actually start putting together deals and then you start getting really better. Eventually you can like go to be an expert and a master. But at some point you gotta get to that point where you're like just about Com almost competent, and I didn't realize that I'd, I'd grown a lot, but I, I still can't put deals together. I got no money in my pocket. Maybe this is not for me. So, so the point is that you don't need the money to start this. You, you kind of need to get money is important. Depends on what you're doing, but you need to get your determination, your drive, and your understanding, and build up your skill set. Uh, second issue was I had a, a commercial real estate collapse. I realized the value of recurring income because I have commission and. You, don't have any knowledge that you'll ever have another deal again after you close the deal. So you can't rely on these big fat commission checks. A guy comes to me with, people come to me with opportunities all the time, I turn them down because I don't want to work with friends or whatever it is, people are constantly coming to me. But one guy came and it was the timing was right, I saw the writing on the wall in real estate, and he wanted to start a parking company. And I'm like, I don't give a shit about parking, I valet my car through, I park three blocks away so I don't have to valet. I don't even like valets, <laughs> you know. But he'd been in the business since the 90s, He's a fantastic manager, some of the biggest lots, uh, uh, locations in Los Angeles, and uh, terrible businessman, he had no money. I had a bit of money, and I'm good at closing deals, so I'm like, cool, I'll, I'll, I'll bring in the business, I'll finance it, fund this thing, you manage it. It'll be passive income for me after I get this set up, and active income for you, and you got a business. And it worked out. So, so that, that's a symbiotic relationship, that worked out. So it really depends on, on the scenario. Um, that was a good question. It's a great point. We're both nodding when you're talking about how there's times in the business where you always just want to give up. And, and that's a good point. That, uh, for me, anyway, right after that, you're right. It did turn out to do quite well. But if you have a business and you don't want to give up at least a few times, then you, I've never had it where you didn't want to. So there's always, these are like peaks and valleys. Entrepreneurship is not an easy thing necessarily. Um, and especially for people who, that, well, that's why so many people want a salary job, right? Because, well, I'd rather get $2,000 a month that I know I'm going to get, or at least have a security that I think I'm going to get that, rather than maybe I'll get $20,000 or maybe I'll get zero. And so, yeah, it can be very difficult. But, you know, I was thinking your question about starting a business with no capital or being a younger person with no capital. Every single business I've ever started in my life, I've started putting zero dollars in. Um, and when I was younger, I was broke, broke, broke. I'm still fairly broke, but I've done okay now. Um, but um, for example, the internet company that almost went to a billion dollars for a little while, I started that out of my house. And thanks to the internet, uh, I think really the internet just opens up so many options. Now without the internet, I would, I didn't, would be in trouble. Yeah, I, I'd be in big trouble. Most of my business, well, every business I do is on the internet really in one way or another. Um, so I started that out of my house, and what I did there, I actually had, so I started it, and you know, I was just like um, feeling my way around. I, I knew there was opportunity, because I'd always been a computer nerd, so as soon as the internet came out, I was like, finally, they connected all the computers together, right? So I was like, what am I going to do on here? And I was actually interested in stocks at the time, and so I was from Canada, and, I, and there was not even a way to get Canadian stock quotes on the internet, this is 1994, and I thought, oh, I want to do that, I'm sure that'll be something that'll turn into something. Uh, but I, I did need to pay like the exchanges and stuff for their data. I don't even have any money. So what I did is I went to public companies and I said, look, I'm going to make you a website, right? So I tried to just make the money any way I could to get the capital to do the things I wanted to do. And uh, so you, back in 1994, it was so funny selling websites. So you'd call it up, you'd say, hey, uh, we can do websites for public companies. First question, what's a website? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, well, it's a thing on the internet. What's the internet? And I was like, whoa, it's, it's more education than anything. So yeah, so I did that, and you know these things, and oh, I went, I was this close to going under with that company two or three times. Uh, there was one time I was driving around town just trying to find the people who owed me some money to get it so I could make payroll, and uh, if I didn't, you know, they didn't owe it to me for another like 30 days or something, and I was like, 
please, you know, help me out here. Like, I'm gonna be in big trouble here. Uh, so yeah, you go to these peaks and valleys, but um, you know, recently that the uh, Acapulco thing I'm doing, zero dollars down, and I have a real estate company and a hotel now. Um, and I've never put a dollar of my own money into it. All I did, like I said, I found a place, I offered it. You know, you can't do that as much in the U.S. because you need to get permits, a real estate license. You have to become a real estate, you know, go to school for it or something. And um, but down there, I just uh, found, and that's so many opportunities in the foreign world, right? Like Nicaragua, you could, I can name you 30 countries. You just go there, find a way to go there, and you'll find 100 things you can do over the internet to, to do things. So I just found condos, and I just, they didn't have a website, so I just offered them for sale. And because I speak English, uh, and they didn't, uh, I opened up a huge uh, amount of people to, to, uh, who want to buy these things. And then I just started renting them out for them on their behalf, and, and they're all in the same building, so it's basically a hotel. So, um, so you know, I'm selling these condos, so they're putting the money in to buy the condo. Uh, they're putting the money in, and I do the renovations. They pay me to do the renovations, and my people do I hire people to do it. Uh, and then I, I now have a guy who manages it, and he rents out to condos. Uh, so zero dollars I've ever put into that business, and I have two decent businesses there. Um, even my current one, the Dollar Vigilante Newsletter, there's something I just saw an opportunity. I knew people wanted this information or, or would want this information and uh, just started a newsletter. So that's zero dollars. Well, you know, you pay ten dollars to GoDaddy or something, or domain name or something. Like that. You know, less than a hundred dollars down, really. Every single thing I've ever done. And this Dollar Vigilante thing I'm doing is growing right now to the point I think by next year it'll be close to a million dollars a year in revenue. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's not there right now, but I think that growth has is headed that way. So there's another one. Um, would any of you, if, if you found an opportunity that was great in the next 30 days, would you go for it? I mean, are you prepared to go jump into it? I wouldn't right now, okay. personally, because I have several things that I'm doing, and right. it, it's just it's enough. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's so big. There's so many opportunities out there yeah. right now. That we that we could do. There's there's a million. See the thing is that I realize when you when you want to put together deals, that credibility is, is sometimes more important than it, that the deal is even exciting. Because there's a lots of deals that are promised 120 percent return a year, but people still invest their money two or three percent return a year mm -hmm. because they they know that they don't lose it all. So so like there's a million deals out there. I'm I'm, I'm getting flooded with these things all the time. But how often do I see something that? I believe it's credible and I want to jump on. One thing that I'm doing right now, I'll tell you, um, David Fridman's here, his son Patry Fridman has a uh, new project out in Honduras, and you might have heard Michael Strong talk about this yesterday, uh, about charger cities, and uh, which in essence is like a new country. And I'll talk to you about this It's a tax-free zone. It's a tax-free zone. Yeah. Uh, it's not just tax-free zone, it's you, you make your law, you just have to follow criminal law. But other than that, it's, it's, it's your own, you set it up. Uh, it, the intention is to lay the groundwork to build the, the, the Hong Kong in the Americas eventually. It's really <laughs> ambitious. Pachi is very ambitious. He's getting a big team together to do it. And I'm like, I've worked with a lot of developers, and um, and I'll be uh, doing what I can to close deals for development and, and businesses out there. Uh, so so yeah, I, I saw that. I'm like, you know what? That's more than just a cool opportunity that the business opportunity. That's just exciting in general. So yeah, I, I, I just uh, just got involved a lot a couple of weeks ago, like a month ago. Okay. So yeah, just jump on that. Just to yeah, just to throw out some to answer your question, the um, if I was offered an opportunity, would I do it? It depends if I had to actually put any time into it. Since just do it, <laughs> <laughs> right? but if it was something where I just had to introduce someone to somebody or something and make a phone call, I'll do it obviously. But I'm just too busy, same as same as sounds like Paul is. But um, uh, you know, I do see opportunities all the time. That's you know, as entrepreneurs, I think that's what we're pretty good at doing. I would say. I mean, what are our skill set? Just what we can see. Sort of like Steve Jobs. You know, he would say that he he would never do a focus group or a market uh, surveys because he, his thought mm -hmm. was that people don't know what they want. He has to actually create what they want. So we we're sort of like seeing what where we think things are going and we can see people will want it. They don't necessarily want it now and that's why starting a business sometimes can be a little slow at start because we're positioning ourselves to be there when they all get there. And um, But I've got so many ideas that I can't even do and I'll throw one out there right now. Um, 
down in Argentina, Doug Casey's doing a development. Okay, so this is 300 lots. They've sold almost all of them now. It's over 200 been sold. These are all millionaires and billionaires buying this. It's sort of like a golf sculpture. It's just a bunch of like really w smart entrepreneurs and well-off people and scientists, and they're sick of all this statism and they're going down there to sit in northern Argentina and and just be amongst themselves, right, and be amongst other like-minded people. So here's a little town in northern Argentina called Cafejate. <laughs> you know, it's just a little, it's a beautiful little town, but y no one would have ever even heard of it before. It just, it's a wine growing region, which is really growing, but it really didn't have anything going for it. Now you, you plant 300 millionaires and billionaires yeah. there. There's going to be one or two opportunities. <laughs> Start up a restaurant, or, you know, <laughs> anything, anything. Coffee shop. Yeah, yeah. anything. A chocolate shop. Yes. Yeah. I was there, there's no chocolate shop. And chocolate and wine, there you go. There's a hundred thousand opportunities. So that's one reason. Any other questions on entrepreneurship? Sure. Yeah, what do you think about lawyers and contracts, especially when you're first starting a company? They can be pretty expensive and um, just like you've been burned by them. for three seconds or less. I don't think I've ever used a lawyer for any, well I did with the internet company because I got to the point where we're gonna go public. I've always just sort of done things. I don't care about the legal stuff. Like for example, when I sign contracts with people, they always want to sign a contract. I don't even care about contracts. I say, listen, I'm telling you what I'm going to do. And if I don't do it, then you'll never do business with me again. And that'll be that. Uh, I'm not going to take you to court and all this. It's, it's, it's all, and it, that was a good point about, uh, you didn't use the word confidence, but you used the word that people need to be, um, well anyway, I use the word confidence. People need to have confidence in you. Uh, and that's what 90% of business is, because you can do business with anyone, but if, if they're going to be stealing from you or, or never do what they say they're going to do, then that's worse than anything, right? But if you can find those few people who do what they say they're going to do and don't steal from you, then you stick with them always on anything. And you always try to work with those sort of people. So so for me, I don't even care about lawyers, um, I'm sure. Uh, but I've never had a kind of business where you need to do stuff like that. Um, I have... Uh, it's more than 30 seconds, sorry. <laughs> I have a good accountant and I have several lawyers that I know, another business deals with lawyers. Um, but I never use them. I mean, I use the accountant, accountant at tax time to make sure, you know, I give him the real numbers and I pay whatever he tells me I'm supposed to pay it. And so I don't have any problems. Uh, but I do just, you know, the minimum that I need to do. Um, I look for people the same. I look for people that do what they're saying they're going to do. Uh, I don't care if you're the greatest genius in the world. I don't care if you're the absolute best of everything. I want people that I work with who will do what they tell me they're going to do and show up on time. Are That's they hard to find? Not so much, but yeah, they can be. They can be. Uh, find them, you keep them. You absolutely. When you find them, you keep them. Yeah. Well, I got a lot to say on that. I wrote a blog article uh, called How to Handle Lawyers Threatening You that exploded the traffic <laughs> on my blog. I have a blog at hustlebear.com. Um, and that just took, the, I had 10,000 views in 24 hours on that from posting it and then it just continued to growing and all over Twitter. So yeah, I have a lot to say about lawyers. I had a lot of experience in that with that in commercial real estate. But before I even talk about lawyers itself, about contracts, I never got, in my whole career in real estate, and I, I had, I was closing like 20 deals a year sometimes, in the height of it, I never got uh, a seller to sign a listing agreement with me ever. Um, he, I, I, as an act of good faith, I mean, you're dealing with a piece of paper. These things can be violated, and 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 so what you want is to have the idea, the terms down there. But what you want to set is a condition where they don't want to violate your agreement. Mm -hmm. You don't want to rely on the piece of paper to make them not do it. You want to make sure that like they they, they like you in their life. They don't want to screw you up. They don't want to piss you off. That's more important than the piece of paper by far. Yeah, uh, it's sort of like a superstitious act. So you're like, oh, I'm gonna put this paper down. You're gonna draw on it, and <laughs> so now everything's right. We have to cool. not be like yeah. undone. I mean, to enforce it, if he does decide to violate that piece of paper, oh, now you gotta pay for lawyers. Oh my God. I mean, what are you gonna do? Like, like go to his house and like, you know? Who but have you guys ever been sued or? Oh yeah, no, I got yeah. I got lawyer letters like once a, a month. Uh, if not once a week during the height of commercial real estate. And, and that's what I was talking about in my article. Uh, the, the backup just about contracts, I didn't get the uh, seller to sign it because he got like a five, six, nine million dollar building. And if he's gonna trust me with like three or four percent of that, 
I want to show him that I trust him, and that I don't need him to sign anything with me. Uh, you know, it, 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 you know, there's no reason for him to try to go around me. We're cool, and he likes me, so I, I get him to trust me, and that's how I got a lot of deals done. But as as far as like, have I gotten like, dealt with lawyers? Yeah, in commercial real estate or in any area where the dollar value starts rising, it becomes actually a lot less civil. You think that things get more civil, or we're dealing with more money, it's more sophisticated. No, it's more barbaric. <laughs> and um, they go after your fucking head. When there's more money involved, like, mm -hmm. it, it gets much nastier. And so uh, a very common negotiating tactic when millions of dollars are on the table, or even hundreds of thousands, but when it gets even bigger, a common negotiating tactic is to bring in a lawyer. That's just part of their negotiation. So it becomes very common. I got all these lawyers' letters all the time, and to me it was like toilet paper. Uh, it's, it's just like, they're, the more that it had uh, precedent case numbers, the more threatening, they're threatening to sue everyone and everyone's grandmother. The more, like, I knew that this is just like uh, heat, that they're just trying to like intimidate you to do what they want to do. Because there's a lot of money on the table, so it's valuable now for them to do it, and they often do get their way. So it's actually smart until they dealt with me, and you could read about that in my article, or I could talk about it, but... Um. I'll tell one quick story. I got sued yeah. once in a publishing deal. Uh, they, they stopped sending me my money and sued me for, you know, a million dollars. <coughs> like, oh, yeah, they're not collecting that. <laughs> um, but, you know, when it was all said and done, I, it was a royal pain in the ass. It took a lot of time and a lot of energy, and it's scary <coughs> as hell. When you get these letters, you're being sued for a million bucks. The first time you get one, you're like, holy smokes. When the whole thing was over, they had to pay me. And my lawyer's bills were precisely the same amount of money that they had to pay me, within $100. So it was just a complete waste of everybody's time and energy. And it, it accomplished nothing, and it you know scared the hell out of my family. I guess I'm so lucky I live internationally. And I don't, I try to do that. I have a passport from a Caribbean country. And if, she, if someone gave me a piece of paper and said they, they want me to show up at some court somewhere in the world, I would just start laughing. Like, are you serious? <laughs> obviously, obviously I'm not showing up. Um, so I'm lucky that way. And, and that's why I've constructed my life to be that way. I don't really live anywhere. I live in Mexico, but I have nothing to do with Mexico. You actually want to live in a country as a tourist because the government always treats the tourists the best. Plus, you're not a part of their system. So even if someone sues me in Mexico, you know, for my hotel or whatever, I'd be like, ah, I'll just leave, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll just sell it to some Mexican, <coughs> you know, figure some way to get it or whatever. But uh, you know, I don't want to be a part of any of those systems. Uh, so I'm, I'm lucky that way. You guys live in the U.S., so you have a lot more issues. Do you know I'll, I'll tell you just a quick couple points about it. First of all, there's a businessman behind the lawyer, so for, you first want to make it very ec uneconomical for that guy to want to pursue it. Um, uh, and, and I won't say that actually all lawyers are bad. If, if you're actually ripping somebody off, I support the lawyer going after you. You, know, you deserve mm -hmm. to pay. So there, there, there is real justice, but that's actually rare. The, the uh, industry of law is marked by um, like abuse of the law. That, that, mm -hmm. it doesn't, that's not just occurring. That defines the industry as far as I'm concerned. That's what it's used for. It's like the modern day muscle man. In the pre previous times, you like, took out like hitmen to take care of your problems. Now we have lawyers. And so like, this is this is like the modern day muscle man of a civilized society, and and you have to understand that that uh, people don't hire lawyers to figure out the legal issue involved when they're using one to threaten you. You know, I'm not talking about when they use a lawyer to like do their immigration or status or like plan their estate. When they're using a lawyer to threaten you, they're not hiring the lawyer to figure out the legal matters involved. They're hiring someone to threaten you. The law is just a tool. Making you bend is the point, and breaking you. That's what they're that's what they're trying to do. So what you gotta, we gotta like understand is that it has to be. It, they're doing that as a business calculation. You gotta make it clear really fast. That's not a smart business move. This guy is, is not gonna profit from this behavior. And and I have a lot I can say on that. But go check out my blog, hustlebear.com. Uh, How to handle lawyers threatening you is the article. I talked about that, and it's pretty comical. And, and you'll get a good, quick sense of what to do there. Just to make a quick comment. Uh, I realized after I said it that it sounds like what I'm saying when I, I would laugh if someone gave me a piece of paper is that I'm that I'm like maybe stealing from people and I'm not going to you know go to justice or anything. No, that's not the case at all. Like if someone's going to do a frivolous sort of yeah. lawsuit, but obviously if 
I would never want to steal from someone. That, you know, your reputation is your most important thing. So if anyone ever has a problem with me, please call me. Please let me know. Did I do something wrong to somehow take from you that I shouldn't have? But, you know, to send me a lawyer thing and tell me to show up to some court, no, just call me on the phone. You know, I'm always I want to do the right thing. Otherwise, I'll be out of any business I do very quickly, especially on the internet, because people can find out about you so fast. That uh, So I'm not trying to avoid sure. as things like that. The problem is we have a frivolous lawsuit. Right, yes, I agree with that. So, and and they'll, they'll use that against you really quickly. Yeah. But we're almost out of time. Does anyone have a really quick question about entrepreneurship? Could you spell your blog, please? Uh, hustle, H-U-S-S-E-L-E. Okay. B-E-A-R dot com. Any other questions? Um, you're talking about how you're not a citizen of Mexico. Right. Uh, where are you a citizen of? Are you? Yeah. Well, you, know, you can't be stateless and, and travel nowadays yeah. with a passport, right? Um, I don't tell people exactly where I, I am because um, I'm still Canadian as well. I still have a Canadian passport, and I don't want the Canadian government to know uh, where I am. Um, however, I will say this: uh, that. Um, the best place in the world, in my opinion, to get a second passport, if anyone's interested, is uh, at the moment, the easiest way to do it and cheapest is a place called the Dominican Republic. Um, but yes, I, I just live in Mexico as a tourist, and you get a six month tourist visa when you go in, so I travel more than, I travel almost every month outside of Mexico, so, so I don't have to be a resident there or a citizen or anything. You have to live in the Dominican Republic for a certain no. length of time to get that passport? Nope. That's one of the great things. It's really easy, convenient, quick. We actually out offer a service and another business I have. <laughs> uh, to, uh, to we've got it all lined up. You just show up. Five, three, it takes three years total to get it, but it, it's total including airfare from the U.S., including hotels under ten thousand dollars. And uh, we show up. We take you around to all the government offices, get your picture taken, and all that, and, and uh, so it's really easy. What's the name of that? If you if you look on my website, it's called the Dollar Vigilante, dollarvigilante.com. Uh, in the menu bar, you can see Dominican passport services. What if you don't speak Spanish? <laughs> you actually to become a citizen to get the passport, you go through about a ten minute uh, what they call sort of like a they question you about stuff in Spanish. So yes, within those three years, take a Spanish course. <laughs> The questions are fairly really simple. We're, we'll tell you what the questions are going to be. It's stuff like, what's the capital of the Dominican Republic? <laughs> it's just like, donde esta la capital de la Dominican Republic? <laughs> As Santo Domingo esta, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Can you share the approximate cost for someone to go through that process? Like, like I just said, including everything, including flights there, because you're going to have to cover it. Uh, under 10000 Wow. Okay. Okay. And are there negative consequences if the U.S. knows you have done that? Uh, no, not as far as I know. The U.S. doesn't have any laws or anything that says that you can't have a second passport. They probably will in the future, though, so that's why you should get one now. <laughs> uh, no, there's nothing. They, you know, the U.S. government is bad as it is. They're not going around the world trying to get every single American they can and get all their money, right? So they've got 305 million that are inside the country. Now, they do go to places like Panama and still try to get a few more, but, uh, you know, they're not, you know... I wouldn't worry about the American government like worrying that you have a second passport or even having bank accounts. All, all they act, actually ask is that you uh, uh, report it, yes. Uh, which is actually a horrible thing. You know, I don't know, if, just really quickly, in Jamaica in 1970s, they started demanding that Jamaicans report all their foreign income. A few years later, they basically uh, told them they had to hand in their foreign uh, stuff, but they'll give them Jamaican dollars for it. Within a few years, those Jamaican dollars were worthless. So, uh, um, you know, I can kind of see the road the U.S. is going. I'm okay with that. Is someone using this room afterwards? Or we can keep talking a little bit. Yeah. Are we? There, there is. I'm sure. But we got like another. Yeah. Yeah. A couple more minutes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
income tax if we live outside of the country. They do for Americans. Let me jump on you, sir. One of the things about, about getting money um, more or less hidden is that it's not necessarily easy, but it's not really illegal because that's what a lot and a lot of a lot of old money rich people do. Trusts, offshore, you know, you can put the money in an offshore corporation. Well, it's not in your name. It's a, it's owned by the corporation, not you. You may be the primary stockholder. But rich guys, old money people, have done this forever. All sorts of offshore trusts and all sorts of things can be done to, you know, to keep your money yours and nobody else knows about it. But it takes work and it takes some expense to set up such trusts, to find the right people to set them up for you, to find the right jurisdictions, and all sorts of things like that. That can all be done. The question is, how easy is it? The interesting thing happens when people get good at it and the price comes down to where not just the mm -hmm. uber rich can do it. That's a very interesting moment. Uh, one thing that people, I'm surprised no one's done it thus far, is to put together cooperatives where these like 30 or 50 or 100 people get together and each put up a few thousand bucks and they set up a foundation in wherever, um, you know, uh, somewhere in Central Europe, uh, something in Switzerland, something somewhere else, and they all share the structure and, and have one person that's in charge of doing the accounting in and out, and so they can all share the structure rather than all of them than having each one having to build their own. Somebody should do it. I'm not going to be the guy. Um, you know, so things like that can be done. You know, it's in when when a regular guy or a guy you know who's you know has a few bucks extra has the capability to do that, then things get very interesting. Well, I just had a comment um, relating to what you were saying. I just came across an article on Bloomberg on the internet about how Google is paying an effective 2.4% tax rate on their income, and they're using a, a a company called Google, they've licensed their technology to Google Ireland, which is based in Bermuda, then they have Google something else that's in Ireland, and then a final company in the Netherlands, and they, they've licensed, they, they, all the profit flows to, the, to the, the, the Bermuda company, and then to Ireland, and then to the Netherlands, and then there you go. And, they, and apparently they set this up through the IRS. They take their taxes, you know, and they take their expenses in a high tax jurisdiction, they take their profits in a low ta tax jurisdiction, they hold it somewhere else. Yeah. It's usually a way around government. Uh, <laughs> it's just a matter of, of doing it, really, but um, that's the good thing. But like I said, there's both. That's why they actually want most Americans to be just employed workers, right? Because when that's when you're screwed. That's why being an entrepreneur is so much better. I saw a stat recently in the US, it said the average net worth of uh, entrepreneur was something like a million dollars or something. Now, of course, people like Bill Gates is going to skew that a little bit, but it said the average uh, net worth of a salaried employee was like nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just so stark of the differences because they're screwed. And I learned that when I first became an entrepreneur. So I started out working for people, right? I worked at a bank and that. Mm -hmm. It's like, I look at my paycheck at the end and it's like, and there's no way around it, right? right. There's no write-offs or anything. It's like, oh, <laughs> how am I supposed to live on this? Uh -huh. right? So I started a company it's like, oh, well, I just went out for lunch, right up. <laughs> oh, I just went, you know, I went to go take a vacation. Why? Perhaps on business. Right? <laughs> 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 yeah, no taxes. Yeah. Well, I think we need to let people do it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very but much. Yeah, I'm Joe. <laughs>